Welcome to Nicole's Review. With Nicole's Review, we feature Talk That Matters. In this episode today, we have Dean Cavarada. Dean Cavarada, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Nicole, for having me. Let's take a few minutes to have you describe a little bit about yourself. Give us a little bit about your background. Sure. Well, Nicole, uh, I was Mr. Trump's uh, statewide director for Massachusetts during the presidential campaign here in Massachusetts during the primary. Mm -hmm. And uh, originally I'm from Acton, Massachusetts. I'm a Northeastern graduate. Uh, my background is in education and transportation. Uh, I've done political campaigns and I've been involved in a lot of uh, Republican and conservative campaigns over the years. And this was a very unique opportunity for me to do a presidential campaign for the first time. Very good. Now, Dean, you won the primary. Please tell us how you did that. No one believed that you could, but please tell me. Right. We were in a very uh, crowded 2016 Republican primary uh, for the uh, nomination. Mr. Trump was one of many, many candidates. Uh, and uh, Massachusetts had a front-loaded primary on March 1st, Super Tuesday. So our state played a role. That would be different in the general election. But we played a major role in the general election uh, for New Hampshire. But in the primary, we had to really uh, build a statewide uh, campaign. We didn't really have a lot of help from other uh, politicians here here in Massachusetts, so it was really a grassroots effort on the Republican side to get Mr. Trump out there. Uh, we decided to have our campaign headquarters in Littleton, Massachusetts, and then we had another uh, campaign office down in Eastern Mass in the southeastern part of the state, and we really tried to build it that way. So we both helped New Hampshire, which was the first of the nation primary back in February, and we helped here in Massachusetts on March 1st. Very good. Now, um, Dean, tell me, uh, have you been in pol politics a long time? Have you been working? Yourself? I have. I've worked on a lot of campaigns. I was a big supporter of Karen Polito and her campaigns for lieutenant governor and state treasurer in 2010. I'm from central Massachusetts, so I, I was involved out there in Hudson, Mass, too, with Governor Paul Cellucci. Mm -hmm. That's kind of former Governor Cellucci, where I got my start. Uh, I went to Northeastern for political science. Uh, my faculty advisor was Michael Dukakis. Wow. We didn't agree much on policy, but we uh, did agree on the need to get involved and to get young people involved. And we, uh, we certainly did a lot of work on transportation, and he was very helpful in, in getting me working with the Deval Patrick administration. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was a Republican that worked with both sides, and uh, that was very helpful in my career mm -hmm. uh, in, in prior years. That was one of the other questions that I was going to ask you. How did you get the youth, uh, the young um, uh, Millennials. People? Yeah, how did you work on that? Well, I think uh, this uh, campaign year was different, right? I think Bernie Sanders uh, deserves a lot of credit for getting young people involved, the Hillary Clinton campaign, the Donald Trump campaign, and others. Uh, and I think millennials see that their future is on the line, that they have to get involved in politics, that it doesn't matter if you're a Republican, Democrat, Green Party, conservative or liberal, that uh, now's the time to get involved uh, because so much is at stake. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, every, everything's changed if you think about it since 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, war and peace, terrorism, the economy, uh, the Great Recession, uh, the leftovers of the Great Recession and how we move forward as a country and as a state. Yeah. Now, how did you become the former Massachusetts Director. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes you have to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, I didn't plan on doing a campaign in 2016. Uh, I was working as a counselor, believe it or not, a social worker at Worcester County Sheriff's Office uh, for Lou Evangelitis. So I was doing social work. I was doing teaching. Uh, and so I got the call back, so to speak. I thought I was out of this. Uh, 2014 was my last campaign for Charlie Baker and Karen Polito. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I interviewed with the New Hampshire State Director who had some Massachusetts ties. Uh, we met at one of the Trump rallies, and the following week I was hired, and the next thing I know, they gave me the keys to our office, and they said, build a statewide campaign, and you have to go against all the other campaigns like Jeb Bush and uh, you know all the other campaigns that were more established, and Mr. Trump was a newcomer to politics. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had a lot of volunteers early on, and uh, I knew we had something special when we kept uh, running out of materials at mm -hmm. our office, and you had new people coming in our office. Uh, and the rest is history. Yeah. That's unbelievable. You know, campaigns are never perfect. Uh, sometimes, uh, usually the old rules used to be that the candidate who makes the most few, the fewest mistakes is the one, one that wins. <laughs> I think looking back at this election cycle, the candidate that can come off as most genuine, that has new ideas, 
that was anti-establishment. Both uh, B Bernie Sanders and Donald mm -hmm. Trump in the primary set that tone. Mm -hmm. And uh, clearly the voters uh, did not want business as usual mm -hmm. uh, in Washington, D.C., considering all the problems both domestically and internationally. Yeah. Now, but, um, another question to mind now. Did you have a special formula to win all these votes? How did you... Well, uh, we, we got 49.6% of the primary vote, uh, so it was a remarkable achievement. We were the number one state for Mr. Trump in all of February and March throughout the country. Uh, I think one of the reasons we did so well compared to other campaigns is that we got so many people involved. Mm -hmm. We established town captains or community leaders, and we try to build a, a grassroots campaign from the bottom up. Uh, and, you know, you have to follow what works. And so uh, even as a Republican, I can say that Barack Obama and Deval Patrick in prior campaigns mm -hmm. did a, a magnificent job of building the grassroots, of getting people involved. And what we learned about this campaign is that there were a lot of voters that were willing to come back and participate mm -hmm. that ordinarily don't vote in a gubernatorial or presidential cycle. So we got a lot of new people involved. Uh, we reached out to the colleges early, particularly UMass Lowell, since mm -hmm. it was close to our offices. Mm -hmm. um, and the national campaign did us a favor, too. They had a big rally in Worcester with Mr. Trump, and then they went to Lowell, uh, and we were the beneficiary of those lists of people that wanted to get involved. And I think we did a good job of calling them. And as you know, you got to keep calling people and get, keep giving them an opportunity to get involved. A lot of work. A lot of work. So, yes. But we kept asking, and so they kept... Uh, coming forward and mm -hmm. uh, we had a really good operation in February and we played a major role for New Hampshire, Mr. Trump's win in New Hampshire, which was a must win people remember back uh, since Ted Cruz won mm -hmm. Iowa right. and Mr. Trump had to get some wins on the board to start mm -hmm. his campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, now, did you have a special office to work out of or did you have to go different places in Massachusetts? Well, any place with Wi-Fi and, and we could open our <laughs> laptop was, was an office. Uh, <laughs> modern campaigns are mobile. Yeah. Uh, they're decentralized and that's a good thing. Uh, and that would prove even more so in the general election when uh, Jerry Kushner, Mr. Trump's son-in-law, mm -hmm. uh, professionalized our operation and really did a magnificent job. Social media, as you know, has really changed the face of campaigns. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, modern campaigns are very much uh, targeted to the voter, mm -hmm. their interest in integrating that with data and media. Uh, and, you know, the other thing that made this such a unique cycle is that the candidate that did not spend the most one money won. Right. Mr. Trump ended up spending about 50 percent less than Hillary Clinton. Uh, I mean, both campaigns did a, uh, an amazing job of fundraising in a short amount of time. Right. But I think going forward, whether you're running for local school board or president mm -hmm. or governor or anywhere in between, mm -hmm. it's how do you uh, spend your dollars uh, most wisely and how do you reach people, right. targeted voters, and, and what do they care about? Right, exactly. That's all you care for. And now um, let's talk about what else you do. Your consultant. Can you can you explain that? Uh, what GX Consultant mean? Yeah, GenXConsulting.com uh, is my consulting company, mm -hmm. and basically, uh, I provided uh, political and small business consulting to different clients. I started that uh, when I uh, helped Karen Polito and her campaigns for statewide office. Mm -hmm. uh, first in 2010 as state treasurer when she ran a good campaign against Steve Grossman. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then later uh, helping her launch her lieutenant governor bid with Charlie Baker in 2014. And basically that's my political consulting company where I would help candidates uh, run for office. One of the things that uh, we learned after what happened here in Massachusetts is there are some districts that we can target for legislative seats uh, in 2018 that might prove effective. Uh, and all voters should be concerned with that because the more competition you have and the more contested races we have, mm -hmm. it makes everyone better. Uh, unfortunately, because our state is so one-sided, there's a lot of races that go un unopposed, mm -hmm. and the voters don't get any debate or any dialogue on the issues. Uh, so our side, our, our party here in Massachusetts has to do a better job of, of recruiting people to run. Mm -hmm. And now we have uh, this whole new group of Trump voters and supporters that uh, participated for the first time that we would like to see run, you know, for local school board and mm -hmm. selectmen and, uh, and, and, and get involved going forward. Now, how do you suggest to do that? Well, you have to throw caution to the wind. I mean, campaigns aren't perfect. You're, not, uh, you're gonna make mistakes. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to be an expert on the issues. I think nowadays people want new faces and fresh ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an awful lot of work to serve on town boards. Uh, you know, I was on my local finance committee and housing authority mm -hmm. in my hometown of Acton. And so 
all of our town boards people deserve enormous credit for the time they spend to get involved. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, the Democrats have done a, a much better job of that, uh, so they have a bigger farm team of people to run for office. Mm -hmm. We have to do a better job of doing that. Uh, and, you know, candidate recruitment isn't easy, but I would encourage young people to get involved. I, I jumped right in <laughs> uh, in my 20s, and so hopefully we'll see that going forward. I know it's something that the schools around here right. uh, have a tremendous uh, program, Harvard, uh, JFK School, mm -hmm. Northeastern, uh, and other schools. We won't mention BU or any other. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, that's important because uh, our future, our next generation is the future. Uh, and we we need more candidates, not less. Right. Speaking of school, so are you also working at school? Yes, I'm a cer I'm a I'm a certified high school teacher. So I, I've taught uh, at the high school level, uh, U.S. history. So mm -hmm. education is an important issue mm -hmm. for me. I originally uh, was interested in Mr. Trump both for economic issues and on education because he was in favor of repealing Common Core and the curriculum standards that the federal government tried to introduce under Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And, you know, education policy is something that Mr. Trump will look at and maybe try to figure out what is the next generation of education reform here in Massachusetts. Uh, how do we measure uh, student achievement? What are the best ways to produce better results? Mm -hmm. How do we improve urban schools but let suburban schools continue to do well like here in Arlington mm -hmm. or Acton, Boxborough, my alma mater? Mm -hmm. So one size fits all doesn't really apply when it comes to school policy. Uh, so that's something I'm very interested in. And of course, transportation is always a big issue here in eastern Massachusetts. Right. The future of the MBTA, the future of our roads, how do you fund all of our bridges that need work? over the next five and ten years. Uh, that's something else that it, I'll pay particularly uh, keen attention to as well. So, okay. Now, are you planning to run again? Or are you, um, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out uh, what the best way is to stay involved right now. I'm mm -hmm. working with the transition team a little bit or reaching out to the transition team. Mm -hmm. We have a tremendous amount of talent. Uh, Mr. Trump is meeting with the cabinet level uh, officials right now. and there's a chance that New England will have a strong representation in terms of people getting picked for these big jobs. Mm -hmm. Scott Brown is a finalist for the Veterans Affairs uh, position as, we, as we're taping here tonight. Mitt Romney, it looks like, is a finalist for Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. Rudy Giuliani from New York uh, is going to be a, a play a major role somewhere. So New England and Massachusetts will be, hopefully be represented in the new administration. And that will uh, be effective. I think, uh, you know, our congressional delegation is all Democrat here, but we need representation on the Republican side, too, since uh, the Republicans have all three branches of government now. Wow. That's excellent. Anna, are you actively involved? In I am. I've been involved with the state party for many years. I, I've, I've helped many candidates here. Um, and uh, like I said, I think you know, we're in a unique position here because uh, our governor and lieutenant governor, who are Republican, are going to need a, a cooperative federal administration to get things done for our state. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we'll reach out to our friends on the Democratic side, our, con our congressmen and women. Uh, I will give Elizabeth Warren a call and uh, <laughs> see if she wants to help us. But uh, that, that's how the system works. The election's over. Yep. There's a lot that the country needs to get, focus on, both economically and from a, a military and a defense point of view, how we defend our country. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the war on terror is ongoing, and there's a lot of things that people are concerned about. So the president-elect has a major, major uh, he has a, his, his inbox is very full. Oh, I can <laughs> see that. Yeah. <laughs> and now, do you, can you explain to me what um, our president-elect Trump, Donald, um, Donald Trump, really mean by um, ma making America great again? In well, other words. Yeah, his slogan caught on because I think a lot of people were able to identify visually with what he's trying to say. Mm -hmm. You know, let's make America great again. The suggestion is, is that America has uh, fallen in, with its place in the world. Our economy is not mm -hmm. as strong as it should be, mm -hmm. that a lot of people aren't feeling uh, that they're better off than they were four years ago. Uh, that was proven true with the uh, economic, uh, uh, re you know, and the electoral returns in the Midwest that a lot of voters, blue-collar working voters uh, that might belong to a union, mm -hmm. a trade union, uh, were unsatisfied with where they are, that the Great Recession in, is, is not, uh, we're still not out of that, and that we're still going through a recovery, and there's been a lot of pain out there. Uh, there's 93 million Americans out of the workforce that the, the labor participation rate is the mm -hmm. lowest it's been in our country's history, that uh, we might have two part-time jobs now that replaced our 
former full-time job and was still trying to work to get more uh, mm -hmm. ahead. So Mr. Trump tapped into that. He talked about trade deals being unfair to American workers. Uh, recently in the news, Carrier uh, Air Conditioners were able to stay in Indiana, that he was able to save a thousand jobs this past week, uh, that he convinced Ford Motor Company to keep a plant here in the Midwest and not move to Mexico. Uh, I think uh, Bernie Sanders in the primary talked about that for the Democrats, but Hillary Clinton missed some of the signs when it comes to those economic issues that, you know, what might work for Massachusetts is not going to work for Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And Pen Pennsylvania's economic condition is going to be different than Texas. And so, uh, you know, what we learned, I think, with this campaign is you have to run a 50-state strategy that the needs for Massachusetts, let's say, on making health care work for all of our citizens and having the most flexibility to make our health care reform work is going to be different than Michigan, who's losing jobs uh, to overseas competition. So uh, Mr. Trump did an effective strategy of, of tailoring his message based on the state he was campaigning in. And what we now learn is that he did twice as many visits to the states he won than Hillary Clinton, which is pretty remarkable since Hillary was running for president for a second time. Uh, but Trump uh, lapped her in terms of the number of visits to these uh, swing states. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. You, you, you reap what you sow. And uh, uh, the campaign, as we now know, uh, tailored everything in September or October towards what the data was telling us. And so the campaign would send Mr. Trump to those swing states uh, where the numbers changed. And uh, uh, it benefited him in the end with his strong uh, returns in Wisconsin and Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania. Hmm. Now, do you think that um, Mr. Trump um, crisis will be uh, a problem throughout his presidency? Well, yeah. you know, I think uh, he understands uh, that campaigning is different than governing. Mm -hmm. And now that he's the president-elect and uh, you know, he's under a microscope and every word he said is going to be analyzed and he's got to, you know, turn, he's got to have a functioning government by January 20th. You're seeing the transition move very quickly. Okay. Uh, he is at a faster pace now with uh, appointing these top jobs than Barack Obama was. Mm -hmm. So he is, he is starting to name his team. And, you know, these people are going to need uh, tremendous support from the Congress, and they'll work very closely uh, to get off to a, a fast 100 days. Okay. But I think he understands that you have to strike a different tone as the president mm -hmm. as opposed to a candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But then again, you know, his style got him a lot of attention. Uh, right. uh, he got a tremendous amount of free media coverage, <laughs> both from uh, the cable networks. I see. Uh, again, I, I, it can't be understated that we had the most nimble campaign in the country. Uh, that he spent vastly less amount of dollars in the beginning than, than Mitt Romney or Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton, and he got a return on that investment by, by being able to talk to the cable news networks. Mm -hmm. Of course, there was a lot of controversy. He made mistakes. He was a first-time candidate. Right. He's bombastic sometimes in his style. But a lot of, of, of uh, voters, particularly newer voters, were drawn to, you know, he's not a normal politician. He's a businessman. He's right. had a d different background yeah. than, a, than a congressman, a senator, now running for, for president. So I think that that was in his favor to be an outsider. Now, do you think because um, would it be a, a different outcome if he wasn't a TV host back in his life? I think that just... helped him. I think his name recognition, his brand, so to speak, his tremendous following on social media, right. uh, he stood out in, the, in that primary. Uh, yeah. You know, when we were running with all of those other candidates, they couldn't really get it, uh, the attention right. that, he, that was drawn to him. Uh, Jeb Bush could not catch traction early on, uh, and in that crowded field, he kind of stood out. And so uh, when you have all these candidates, maybe too many, uh, other Republicans might argue, that <laughs> benefited him from a strategic point of view to be one of 16 that really was different. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the election returns cer certainly started showing that uh, once we won New Hampshire and kind of got some momentum. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, now, how concerned is he um, for American people? Well, I think, I think uh, he, he, he bears the responsibility not only now of being the leader of the Republican Party, and all of the local officials and other officials that work with him, you know, with both branches of uh, the, the House and Senate both being Republican, uh, I think he, he understands that he's now the leader, and, and you have to set the agenda. The president sets the agenda. 
Uh, of course, you know, my, I tell my old history students that the executive enforces the laws of our land and, and Congress uh, passes and creates the laws, but he'll lay out what he wants to do based on his campaign promises. And uh, the Republicans have an awful uh, great opportunity here to, to get things passed that their voters care about. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we'll see in two years when the voters come back and vote again that, you know, do they support what's happening or do they vote in new people? You know, Nicole, one of the things that we should talk about that a new president uh, uh, does is he ends up being the consoler in chief for our country during national crisis or times of mourning. So I know we were talking about during the break about um, uh, the plane crash, the unfortunate accident of the Brazilian soccer team. Yes. And, uh, you know, that's a role that any president has to step up and do. Obama did it, you know, many times, unfortunately, with our, with our shootings and national tra tragedies. And uh, I remember Ronald Reagan back in 1986 with the Challenger explosion uh, and, and, you know, going on national TV and talking about how the Challenger exploded and mm -hmm. really trying to, to you know, help a grieving nation. Of course, George W. Bush with 9-11 uh, and then addressing a joint session of Congress several days later when he held up the police shield of, of that w the mom who gave uh, his, his son died at 9-11. Mm -hmm. and, and he said that he'll re always remember what happened to our first responders. So I know we talked about that. So that's another thing that, that President Trump will have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just a really unfortunate to see these young athletes... Uh, I don't even know if we know anything about what happened with the, the crash. Do we yeah. know anything about the crash yet? Yeah, I think it's um, 75 people die, um, six survivors. I just just want to say that I send my love and prayers for the um, families. The families that lost their lives and uh, the, the people that are grieving. I just want to say that God blessed. Um, I just feel terrible, and I just want to send my love and prayers for the families that are going through this at the moment. God bless, and the six survivors, and I wished the families uh, best of luck and prayers and anything that I could do, and I just, I, I feel like I could do something, and, and I could send prayers and love, and I, good luck, and, um, hopefully they find out what happened in terms of, uh, to see what's your mechanical going on. failure or something they can learn from the accident about that, so. It's just devastating to, to me and my show and my team and us in America and anything we could do, and I don't know. It makes us count our blessings, that's that's for sure. Yeah. And the survivors, the six survivors. That's amazing. That's, that's amazing. Miracle. When you look at the wreckage, you look at the uh, the scope of the uh, of the crash site, and uh, that is just absolutely amazing to see uh, yeah. anyone walk away. And I'm, I'm sure that will be, you know, as eyewitnesses to what happened, they, they might provide the uh, investigators a lot of information as to what happened. And hopefully the, the six survivors can tell us what happened. Yeah. When we pray God that they're continue getting care, health care, and then hopefully. Anything else you'd like to say, Dean? No, I just I, I want to wish you the best on your show, and thanks for having me. Arlington's a very special place for me uh, since I have family ties here. The old Brattle Pharmacy here in Arlington Heights uh, mm -hmm. is a very special place for my family who, who ran that, mm -hmm. and it's a pleasure to be here, and we support local cable, that's for sure. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you for watching the show, Nicole's Review with ACMI-TV. Thank you.